الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة على المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبته ومن اهتدى بهديه إلى يوم اللقاء وبعد We live in a time of human advancement سبحان الله There was a time we'd look up at the birds and see them fly and think You know I want to fly And today the poor bird as it flatters its wings trying to fly it looks sideways and sees man in an aeroplane asleep and still flying and now the bird is thinking I want to fly like that we have advanced man has landed on the moon today you sit here and tooth on the brink of 2015 and in your hand is an iPad or an iPod or a little gadget and with it you will speak to someone from the other end of the globe. And not only speak to them, you'll see them. Humankind has advanced. There was a time if a doctor wanted to see inside you, he had to open you up. Now he x-rays you or ultrasound or MRI and, and so on and so forth. And he can read the inside you from outside. Man has advanced. Man has reached levels of technological advancement that was unimaginable in the times that passed. And with this advancement comes this notion of self-efficacy, that I can. And with it comes self-reliance. And with this reliance and self-sufficiency and self-determination, man becomes too dependent on himself. So he thinks he is it. There is no other power. He thinks there is no one that has power over him. No one that can hold him in check or no one to whom he will have to account. Man becomes heedless. And if you look around you, man has become heedless. Look at what we have done to the environment. Man has become heedless. The ozone, the ozone layer is depleted. Man has become heedless. Global warming is over us. And man still doesn't realize that, he is, that his unethical and immoral conduct is destroying not only the planet but lives. And it is important at this juncture on the brink of 2015 for gatherings like this to take place gatherings which change your paradigm which recalibrate your compasses which brings you back to an alternate reality that man you will go and give account to someone you will have to stand in front of your creator and your maker and explain an account for the life which you had and how you spent it. As such a topic with the signs of the Akhirah is designed to make man conscious and conscientious of another world to come. And in that way make him more moral and more ethical. And in our times we need morals and ethics. Everyone needs morals and ethics. The businessman needs morals and ethics. The doctors need morals and ethics. Engineers, the journalists need morals and ethics. Politicians need morals and ethics. It is very important to bring mankind back, or at least amidst ourselves, to try to change our paradigm and recalibrate our compasses and reset our directions that our Main priority isn't to sell an article and it isn't to make money and it isn't to secure oil and it isn't this and that, but our main priority is how to be decent and how to be good and how to be righteous and how to be God-fearing and law-abiding and hard-working. And that is why these gatherings or the, the idea behind these gatherings are that. That we come here as in a certain state and leave here as better individuals and I pray and I know you will pray this prayer with me my Allah Rabbul Izza take us out of this auditorium better than when he brought us into here say Ameen inshallah now 
our shuyukh have spoken to us at length about the signs of the day of judgment. And they have covered amidst them, my Allah bless them, the minor signs of Qiyamah and understand it is difficult to cover the entirety. There's 130 signs that are established just by one of the scholars of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. So to sit in one day and cover 130 signs, it is ambitious and not possible. So we have only touched on here and there. But what we can understand and deduce that life will become difficult towards the end. Challenges will come. Disasters will come. Catastrophes will come. The earth will be covered in injustice and in wars and in battles. And you see that today. Look at the Arab Spring. Look at Syria. Look at Africa. Look at what's happening there in Russia. Mankind is becoming more and more um, unstable and unhappy and miserable and in difficulty and in turmoil. And when the earth is covered with injustice as it is going towards that direction, the Prophet ﷺ gives us the glad tidings of a righteous ruler who will come. Now about this righteous ruler, the Prophet ﷺ says he will fill the earth up with justice and peace as it was filled with oppression and wrong. Good days will come after these difficulties. And with regards to this ruler, a thousand and fifty ahadith have been narrated, of which four are sahih, of which four are sahih. And I want to start a little bit before this, so listen to me, insha'Allah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at his time, one day he came at Dhuhr to the masjid and started to speak about the signs of the end. That this is what will happen and this is what will... And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke from Dhuhr until Asr. And then they gave the adhan for Asr, they stood up, they prayed, the Prophet wasallam stood back up and started to speak again from Asr until Maghrib. And in that way he continued and the Ashab say, he mentioned and went through every sign and we remembered what we could remember and forgot what we forgot. So amidst those signs that the Prophet wasallam mentioned, he mentions this hadith. And I want you to listen to it carefully. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, تَكُونُ النُّبُوَّةُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونَ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَن يَرْفَعَهَا Prophethood will stay amidst you. So long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes for it to remain, then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift up prophethood and prophethood would be no more. And we knew our witnesses that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, prophethood was lifted and prophethood is no more. So Ya Rasul, what will happen after prophethood? So he said, ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً رَاشِدًا فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونَ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَن يَرْفَعَهَا then will come the age of the rightly guided khulafa, the rightly guided khalifas of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They will reign amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes for them to reign. Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift up the reign of the rightly guided. Ya Rasul, what will come after them? ثم تكون ملكا عادا فتكون فيكم ما شاء الله أن تكون ثم يرفعها الله إذا شاء أن يرفعها. Then will come an age where rulership and leadership is passed within tribes as in it will become tribal or it will become legacy and um, lineage based this, this king, the son of this king one will handball it to the one after them 
فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونُ Then this age will stay amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes for it to stay. Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift this age up from amidst you. ثُمَّ تَكُونُ مُلْكًا جَبْرِيًّا Then will come a tyrannical rule, an oppressive rule. And it will last amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes it to last. ثم يرفعها الله إذا شاء أن يرفعها. then Allah رب العزة will lift up this age when He عز وجل wishes to remove that age. then what will come after this age of tyranny and oppression? listen, O Muslims, and glad tidings to you. ثم تكون خلافة على منهاج النبوة. then will come the age of the rightly guided Khalif who will lead in accordance to the teachings of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. This rightly guided Khalif is the one about whom 1050 narrations have come of which four are sahih. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and with regards to him, he is famous amidst us as the Mahdi. And this is part of the beliefs of the Ahlul Sunnah that a person will come who will be from the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasul says, المهدي من عطرتي من ولد فاطمة The Mahdi is from my lineage, as in from my progeny, from the children of Fatima. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, his name will be my name. So his name will be Muhammad. And his father's name will be my father's name. So he will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and as the earth was filled with wrong and oppression, he will fill it with justice and peace. And this this righteous ruler Ali radiyallahu anhu says, and radiyallahu an Ali, Ali radiyallahu anhu says, Al Mahdi yuminna ahl al bayt. The Mahdi is from us, from the family of the Prophet. يُصْلِحُهُ اللَّهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ Allah Rabbul Izzah will prepare him for the office of leadership in one night. So the Mahdi doesn't know he is the Mahdi. And the Mahdi doesn't have the competencies of the Mahdi. Until one night. In one night Allah will transform him. The ahadith mention that a king will die in the jazeera in the Arab Peninsula. And the sons, or three sons of a king, will fight and quarrel over leadership. And to avoid this quarrel, this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, will leave Medina in secret and go to Mecca. Because he doesn't want to be involved in the conflict nor does he want people to turn towards him. So when he goes to Mecca, his aim is to avoid getting tangled up in this leadership struggle. Yet people follow him from Medina into Mecca. And they find him and they take him out. And they bring him to the Kaaba. And there, between the, the Rukn, as in Hajr al-Aswad, and Maqam Ibrahim, they will make bay'ah to him when he doesn't want it. You with me? That didn't sound very convincing. <laughs> so they will make bay'ah to him. And as soon as they have pledged allegiance, two things will happen. Number one, an army will march out from Syria to attack this progeny of the Rasul. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen carefully, is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he is asleep. And in his sleep he starts to move. He looks uncomfortable. He's displaying what he's never displayed before. Discomfort and sleep to the extent that he's moving. Then he got up. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have seen you do what you normally do not do. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Strange is the situation. An army will come from, the, from Syria intending 
the house of Allah from my ummah seeking a man from my progeny to attack him and in another hadith وَاللَّفْظُ لِلْبُخَارِي يَغْزُوا جَيْشٌ الْكَعْبَةِ فَإِذَا جَاءُوا بِبَيْضَاءَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَخْصَفُوا بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخَرِهِمْ and an army will come campaigning towards the Kaaba until it reached the Bayda. And Bayda is an expanse of land between Mecca and Medina, a flat desert land. When it reaches there, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, يَخْصَفُوا بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخَرِهِمْ The earth will suck them in their first and their last. And in another قول, one person or a couple of people will be left just to tell the tale. So this is one of the signs that this one is the one the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intended. First that his name will be my name and his na the name of his father will be my father's name. Second, an army will come to attack him and he will be unarmed and the army will be destroyed by Allah alone. So when this happens, realize that this is the one. And the people that realize it initially or the first batch that go towards him is from our lands, from Khurasan. The black flags will rise from the areas of Afghanistan. And the flags will come towards him. And they will traverse through the land until they come in help of the Mahdi. And his time is a difficult era. The Rasul says it in an eloquence befitting the majesty of the Rasul. Listen carefully, Muslims. Taghzuna jazirat al Arab, fayaftahuha Allah. You will campaign in the Arab Peninsula and Allah will open it. Thumma taghzuna al Fars. Then there will be a campaign against the Persians. فَيَفْتَحُهَا Allah And Allah will open it. Thumma taghzuna al Rum. Then there will be a campaign against. Rome and Allah will open it. ثم تغزون الدجال فيفتحه الله. Then the Dajjal will come and Allah will open it as in will let you conquer it. So the age of the Mahdi is an age of intense struggle. And the Hadith says he will stay with you for seven years. And maybe eight. And if it really extends nine years. And at the last campaign, the Muslims will come and the other side, its opposition will come to face it. And the opposition is so huge. 80 banners, 80 different flags, under each flag, will be 14,000 men. Is it 14 or 12? 12,000 men. I've said 14. If they've got it wrong, that's their thing. But. And anyway, so between those two. And when the two sides meet, and the Muslims see this, a third of them will run away. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will never accept their repentance ever. Because running away reduces and destroys the morale of everyone standing. So then the campaign starts. And the battle is hot and it's intense. And a third of the Muslims will die. And a third will be victorious. Just a third will be victorious. And they will be there on the battlefield collecting the remnants and the booty of war and the hadith says from one tribe 99 have died and one person is left so what joy will he have at victory and what joy will he have at collecting booty so you would think after such a calamity after such a colossal engagement or what is referred to in the books that preceded us as Armageddon you would have expected issues to become more relaxed. Yet, 
as they have just become victorious and are collecting the things of the battlefield, a voice will come out to them that, O oh Muslims, the Dajjal has come in your lands. And the first of the Alamatul Kubra, the first of the major signs, is the advent of the Dajjal or the Antichrist. So the Imam, Al Mahdi, will send ten people, ten riders, to go and investigate and scout, see if the news is correct. And the Rasul says, Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. I know their names and I know the names of their fathers and I know the color of their horses. They will be the best riders of the day. So they will go and see, Ah, the calamity has come. The Dajjal has come. Who is this Dajjal? The first of the big signs of Qiyamah. And understand, when the signs, the major signs are unleashed, they will follow each other like beads on a necklace. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-ayat, ay alamat, kharazatum manzumatum fi silk, fa in yukta'i silku yatba'u ba'duha ba'da. The major signs are like beads on a necklace. When the bead is, when the necklace is cut, one will come after the other. So the Dajjal comes. Where does he come from? Actually, let's describe him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ad-Dajjal mamsuhu al-ayn, maktubun bayna aynayhi kafir, wa fi lafzin kafara. Dajjal has one of his eyes obliterated, like as in wiped out. It is covered. Mamsuhu al-ayn. مكتوب بين عينيه كافر on his forehead is written كافر and the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم separated it كافر يقرأه كل مؤمن every believer can read it whether he is literate or illiterate and one eye is wiped out as in it's covered the second eye is damaged and the the word of the hadith says it has shrunk and it uses the same word that describes when when grapes you know shrivel in the sun and become uh, you know wrinkly and small so the one eye will be covered the other eye will be like a worn out on old or wrinkly grape it will be squeezed down between his forehead will be written kafir the Prophet sallallahu described him, his hair will be curly, his legs will be arced, he walks a little different, he's stubby, strongly built, and his start or where he comes out from again will be from the area of Khurasan. And the description of the Prophet salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi, being from that region, I am even deducing who it will be with. So the Prophet described the people that will come with him, and he uses the word 70,000 of the Jews of Isfahan. And describing the faces, it resembles the area between Afghanistan and and Iran, some of the inhabitants there, the Prophet says they will have flat faces like the shield and their cheekbones will be raised and their faces will be meaty. And they will be wearing cloaks around them. Do the mats. And his first time that he becomes evident will be in the land of the Arabs. And he will travel, he will roam the earth. And the hadith says, not a village will be missed, except he has gone to it. And what kalam, and subhanallah, listen to the ahadith with regards to him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, 
that إنه لم تكن فتنة على ظهر الأرض منذ ذرى الله ذرية آدم أعظم من فتنة الدجال وإن الله لم يبعث نبيا إلا حذر أمته الدجال وأنا آخر الأنبياء وأنتم آخر الأمم وهو خارج فيكم لا محالة Listen there is no calamity on the face of this earth from the time of Adam till Qiyamah come greater than the calamity of the Dajjal and there wasn't a prophet that came and accepted he came and warned his people about him and in another hadith and Nuh warned his people about him Nuh at the t- like very early in human history at that time Nuh warned his people about this calamity of the Dajjal and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says all prophets warned their people about him وَأَنَا آخِرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ and I am the last of the prophets and you are the last of the nations so he will come from you there's no way about it he will come amidst your time لا محالة there is no exception it will come in your time and then he says the Rahmatul Muhda that if he comes وَأَنَا بَيْنَ أَظْهُرِكُمْ and I am amidst you then I will suffice him on your behalf I will fight him on your behalf if I am here and he comes leave him to me but if he comes and I'm not here then I leave you to Allah and Allah Rabbul Azza will be your caretaker and in another hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says from the time of Adam until Qiyamah no Amr has come greater than that of the Dajjal the Dajjal will shake Iman to its core he will come look at the calamity there will be a river of water and a river of fire and subhanallah before he comes three years will happen like this in the first year Allah Rabbul Izzah will order the sky to hold back a third of its rain so a third of the water of the rain will be held back and the second year two thirds will be held back and the third year there will be no rain so a drought and famine has already gripped mankind and then this man comes the Dajjal with him a river of fire and a river of water and he enters into a village amidst the people and he says do you believe in me I am your Lord and when they believe he tells the sky rain and rain comes tells the earth produce your produce and it will produce its produce he will go to a dead person tell a person a Bedouin if I bring your parents back to life would you believe that I am your Lord he will say yes he says rise and two shayateen will come in the image of his parents and will say son listen to him he's your Lord do you see Iman is shaken to its core how do you not believe your eyes he will tell the earth spit out your treasures the hadith says like be, like bees gold and silver and diamonds will come out of the ground and follow him it's difficult times at this instance only iman will see you through listen carefully muslims all the faculties and information gathering tools that you have will be deceived the only thing that you will have left is your hearts and it is important and I insist regularly work on the hearts I will mention although I am deviating one hadith the person came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ya Rasulullah my stomach is hurting so the Rasul said drink honey Allah has put shifa in it so the man drank honey and came to the Rasul Ya Rasulullah I drank honey I had honey my stomach still aching and this is what I mean by Iman 
So the Prophet said, Allah spoke the truth, your stomach lied, go eat honey. So he went, had honey again, and he came, Ya Rasulullah, my stomach is aching. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, your stomach is lying and Allah spoke the truth. Fihi shifa'un linnas, go have honey again. So he had it. He came again, Ya Rasulullah, my stomach is aching and I had honey. So the Rasul said, your stomach is lying, go have honey. He went, had honey, came back. Ya Rasul, my stomach is better. The Prophet said, your stomach spoke the truth. Do you see that Iman must override? And this is the yaqeen of the Rasul. How can what my Lord say not eventuate? Jalla Jalalul Malik. How can what my Lord say not eventuate? So in the time of the Dajjal, Iman will be shaken to its core. And he will go to another group of people, believe they will say no. So he says, sky hold your water, earth hold your produce, and famine and drought and calamity will befall them. It is so easy just to say, خلاص, okay, I believe, let's go, bring it on. That is why it is such a colossal test. And he will stay and roam the earth for 40 days. The first day will be the length of a year. And look at the Ashab of the Rasul. When he said to them, a day like a year, their concern was, it wasn't what time will I wake up and sleep? Do I sleep for six months, O Prophet? They said, what about Salah, O Prophet? How do we pray? If it's, do we pray five times in the whole year? Or, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, اقدروا له قدره. Allocate times for it. Replicate the days. So the first day will be like a year. The second day like a month. The third, third day like a week. And the fourth day will be, fourth and onwards, will be like ordinary days. And he will come, he will traverse every city and every village except for two places. Mecca and Medina. Allah Rabbul Azza has protected those with angels. He will come towards Medina behind Uhud. Behind Uhud. And he will climb the hilltop with his people. And he will say, do you see that white palace? That white palace of Ahmed. And subhanallah, you look at the pictures of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. From that far and that distance, it looks like a white palace. That is the palace of Ahmed. And he gets down to come towards it and the angel shoes him away. And he turns his face towards Bilad al-Sham. And understand, this is the time of the Mahdi. The Imam is here. And the Dajjal has come. And just min bab al-amanat al-ilmiya, I want to mention the a story, and I'll stick to the English for time reasons. This is the story of Tamim al-Dari. And I will give a general mafhum instead of going into it in details. Tamim al-Dari was a sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a Christian who became a Muslim. And he had an amazing experience. There's a few amazing things with Tamim al-Dari. Tamim al-Dari was a very pious Christian. Very devout. And he was traveling one day. And he came in the valley and mountains are alongside him. And the understanding of the times was, when you're in this type of location, ask the jinn of this area for protection. So because you're sleeping here at night, anything could happen. Ask the big jinn here to protect you. So although he's religious and righteous, yet fear gripped him. So he called out at the top of his voice, I ask the jinn of this wadi for protection. So he said, this is before his Islam. So he said, I heard a voice say, jinns cannot help you. 
turn to Allah and go to uh, and go to Medina Ahmad has come he's a prophet or go to Mecca Ahmad has come he's a prophet we have believed in him and are following him so this is one story strange story of Tamim Adari second story is this one Tamim Adari came to the Rasul and narrated a story Ya Rasul Allah I was in a ship and the ocean started to become rough and there's 30 other people with me and the waves you know bashed us from pillar to post for a whole month you know it's tossing us between waves and after a month the waves subsided and we reached near an island and we anchored the ship and took a little boat and came to the island and at the brink of the island we saw a creature the strangest we have seen covered in hair to the extent that we couldn't tell its front from its behind and they look at him imagine the poor guys you know a month of, of seasickness and now here and they see this creature so they said woe be unto you what are you so he said I am Jasasa so they are hesitant and they say we thought he's like a devil so Jasasa said there's a person in that monastery who is longing to see you go to him so they went and Tamim Adari says I saw a man big man chained with his hands around like near his neck and his legs chained and we asked him who are you he said you will find out soon but first tell me who you are and what is your story so they said we were in the ocean the month passed and we came here and we saw Jasasa and Jasasa and the, and the Arabs are very accurate when they tell stories and at least in those days word for word you know this is what happened and now we came here to you so we are from the Arabs so the person asked a few questions tell me about the orchards of Bisan are they so they said what do you want to know because he knows they're from the Arab lands and Bisan is in Syria tell me about the orchards there so he said what do you want to know is it fruitful is it you know is it yeah it's 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 got fruits and it's it's giving fruits and the orchards are good tell me about the lake of Tiberias or Tabaris they said what do you want to know does it have water they said yes it has water people use it so he said soon it will not have any water and with the orchard soon it will not give any fruits and he asked about a couple of other places and they said yes it is good and the man said soon it will not be the case so then he asks tell me about the unlettered prophet and Nabi Yul Ummi tell me about Muhammad has he come and what is his situation yes he has come and how are the Arabs behaving with him they resisted and fought him and then they turned towards him in acceptance and now they have accepted him so he said it is better for them to accept him and obey him as with regards to me I am the Dajjal soon I will be given permission to come out of here I will be released and I will traverse the earth from its corner to its corner not leaving a city or a village behind and I will roam it for 40 days a day like a year and so on and so forth and the Prophet and I will go to every city except for Mecca and Tayyibah so the Rasul at this time narrating the story hit his member like this. He goes, Tayyibah, Tayyibah, this is Tayyibah. Medina is Tayyibah. And in another hadith, it describes how he'll, he will be released. Subhanallah, Ibn Umar annoyed a person um, who they used to consider at the time of the Ashab as he might be the Dajjal. 
So he says, he came and told the story to Hafsa. Hafsa is his sister and the wife of the Rasul. He says, I got him so angry that I saw him fuming like his body is about to explode. Like, you know, when you go red and you feel like you're expanding. So Hafsa said, Woe be unto you, Ya Ibn Umar. Don't you know that the Prophet said he will be released due to a moment of anger? As in the Dajjal will become angry somehow. And he will rip the chains off. Wallahu a'lam. And then he will be released. So then, he will roam the world until he comes. And the Muslims are under the leadership of Imam al-Mahdi. And understand, they don't have the capacity to overcome this challenge. So Muslims are constantly on the back foot until they are locked up and surrounded. In one narration says Baytul Maqdis and one Qawl at the base of Jabal al-Tur. And the Rajih is Baytul Maqdis. They are there. And they are surrounded. And the Dajjal and his army is outside. And the siege lasts. And as the Muslims are in the siege with the Dajjal, and the, the fear is immense. Man will tie their wives and their mothers and sisters out of fear that they will run to the Dajjal and fall victim to it. Even in Medina al Munawwara, when he is camped outside Medina, three earthquakes will hit the city. Everyone will think, oh my God, and run out of the city. So the Prophet said, Allah will purify the city of its hypocrites. And only the true believers will remain. So now the Dajjal after that comes to Baytul Maqdis. And the Imam is there. And the Muslims are there. And they're trying to put up a resistance. And at this juncture, you can try to stop me, Abdullah. The next one is lunch. I can sit here. Uh, so the next, at this point, when they are inside this encampment, Allah Rabbul Izza sends them their solution. And the solution of the Dajjal is Masih, Isa alayhi salam. So listen to, and I will rush through this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Yanzilu Isa ibn Maryam, Bayna mahrudatayni, Wadi'un kaffayhi ala ajnihati malakayni, Inda manarati bayda'a sharqiyya dimashq. Isa, the son of Mary, will descend. How will he descend, ya Rasul? His hand will be on the wings of two angels. He will be covered in two garbs, both tinged slightly yellow. Beige. Mahrudatayni. Wadi'un kaffayhi ala ajnihati malakayni. Where, ya Rasul? Inda manarati bayda'a sharqiyya dimashq. Next to the white minarat at the eastern side of Damascus. And subhanallah, at the eastern door of Damascus, there is a white minaret. And there is the other one of the Umawi mosque. Both white minarets. They didn't exist at the time of the Rasul. But now it is there. So Isa will come down in that, in that place. Then he will make his way towards Bayt al-Maqdis. Or Jabal al-Tur. And the ahadith say, the Muslims... At this stage of thinking what to do. So eventually they come to this consensus. Listen, we can't sit here forever. Let's get out and meet them face to face. So they make this decision at night. That tomorrow we will open the doors and go and take this on head on. And Fajr comes. Fajr comes. Salat of Fajr. And the Adhan is given. And the lines stand up. And Iqama is given. And then Subhan al Khaliq, the day or the area goes dark. The area, and the hadith says, so that a man cannot see his hand. It will go dark. 
And then when light comes back, they see in Isa is amidst them. And the Prophet says, he will lower his head and you will see like moisture on it, as though his hair is wet, but it isn't wet. And when he lifts it, beads roll down his head like liquid, like pearls, and they scatter. And he comes to the Salat of Fajr. And the Prophet says, what will be your situation when Isa, the son of Mary, comes amidst you? Wa imamukum minkum, and your imam is amidst you. The imam is there, Isa alayhi salam. What will be your situation? So listen, the iqama is given and he notices that Isa alayhi salam comes. So he says, ta'ala, salli bina, come lead us in salah so in one qawl the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says isa alayhi salam will put his hand between the shoulders of the mahdi and say ba'dukum umara'u ba'd takramatullahi lihathihi al-umma this is the honor that allah rabbul izza has given this nation you will lead each other so Isa will lead behind, I mean, will pray behind the Mahdi for this salah, for this salah. And the call of the Ahlul Ilm is, and in another narration, he says, the Iqama was given for you. So lead the salah. And then when the salah is finished, Isa, and the people are ready, do you understand they were ready before Isa now for this challenge? That is why when you reach a level, Allah Rabbul Izza will give you its solution. So he says, open the doors. So the doors open. And from afar, the Dajjal sees Isa alayhi salam. The false Messiah sees the real Messiah. And the Hadith says he starts to melt like salt and water. Dissolve like salt and water. And he runs and Isa alayhi salam chases him. And calling he says, it is written that I owe you one strike. I owe you one hit and that will come. So he catches him in the Bab al Lud in Palestine. And in that place, in one narration with a lance and another one with a sword, Isa alayhi salam will strike and show the blood of the Dajjal in his sword. And the hadith says, had he were not to strike, the man would have melted to death. And the Dajjal and the battle with the Dajjal will be finished. And the Muslims have gone through a colossal test. And Isa alayhi salam will come to them and rub their faces out of mercy and kindness and give them the bushara. This is your place in Jannah. This is your place in Jannah. And as this calamity of the Dajjal has just finished, Allah Rabbul Izza will inspire Isa alayhi salam that, O oh Isa, another of my creatures is about to come out. And no power on the face of this earth will withstand them and outstand them. And for that we have brought you a sheikh all the way from Sydney. Allah yahfadhu inshallah ta'ala, Shadi Sulaiman.